Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Jacobson, the president of the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our LA Zoom to You web chat presented by City National Bank. Today's topic is species spanning medicine. I'd like to thank all of you for your support, including Senior Vice President of Corporate Citizenship at City National Bank, Jennifer Nickerson, Glaza Trustee Wendy Denham, Zoo Commissioner Karen Winnick, and special guests of Bob Ulshuler. Today's discussion is being recorded and will be available in about two weeks on the LA Zoom to You event page, along with other past LA Zoom to You presentations. And the link has just magically appeared in the chat. New for this season, live transcriptions are available during all LA Zoom to You web chats. You may enable the live transcriptions at any time by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. And now I am very pleased to introduce our Director of Animal Programs at the Zoo, Beth Schaefer. Beth. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I also like to welcome everybody. We're so pleased to have you here at this web chat presented by City National Bank. Um, thank you all, as always, for all your continued support. It means a lot to us. Um, I thought you might like to hear a few things that are going on around the zoo. Um, hopefully you all know that we have zoo lights back this year for the first time since the pandemic started. So we're really very excited about that. And we hope you all get a chance to come out. It's going very well. Um, winter is not usually a time with a lot of animal things going on, but we do actually have some very cute baby Babarusa that were delivered earlier this year by cesarean section, and they were in the nursery for a while and have now graduated to the Babarusa exhibit. So if you go on that walk past Zebra, you will um, see them out there starting um, yesterday. So they're... Um, really cute and you should all go see them. And of course, um, conservation is one of our biggest missions here at the Los Angeles Zoo. And that has continued um, just a month ago, Dr. Dominique Keller and myself and our Peninsular Pronghorn Keeper, Mark Lingy, were able to go down to um, the Baja Peninsula to participate in one of the first ever pronghorn, Peninsula Pronghorn releases back to the wild. These animals were down to less than 50 in the wild. Um, the project down there has been going on um, for a couple of decades. We've been involved for a little over 20 years. Um, and this is the first time we have had the numbers um, and the ability to release them. So we helped collar them and put some back in the wild, which is of course, you know, as an animal manager, it's one of our dreams to take the expertise that we learn from working with animals here at the zoo and translate that to helping animals in the wild. So even though it's winter, like I said, lots of stuff going on here at the zoo. Um, so today we have um, two speakers, our very own Dr. Dominique Keller. Dr. Dominique Keller is the Chief Veterinarian and Director of Animal Health and Wellness here at the LA Zoo, as well as the Two-Toed Sloth Species Survival Veterinary Advisor. We also have Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz. Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz, MD, is a cardiologist and evolutionary biologist. She's on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School, Harvard University's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology, and the Division of Cardiology at UCLA. Dr. Natterson Horowitz is also a cardiovascular consultant for the Los Angeles Zoo's Medical Advisory Board. Um, so now I will turn this over to Dr. Natterson. Great, thank you so much. This is really an honor to be here. Um, um, all, all of the um, incredible experiences that I have uh, collaborating with uh, Los Angeles Zoo um, are a tremendous privilege. So this is just one of, of many. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, Dr. Dominique Keller and I are together gonna be making this presentation. Today, I wanna just, um, I wanna share a, um, an initiative that, um, 
uh, that Dr. Keller and I have been um, participating um, in together. Um, we've been teaching a UCLA medical school course and, and um, doing some other kinds of collaborations. Um, and I, I call it female health across the tree of life. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a taste of what it's about and, and why I started it. And um, some of what I think are some exciting opportunities for uh, moving forward, uh, connecting the health of humans, animals, and the planet that we all share. So all of my work uh, as, as, a, as a physician and, and now as an evolutionary biologist is, is rooted in, in a basic idea that, that human medicine has for centuries been very much focused on one species, that, that's us. But that by expanding the, that window and, and considering the health of other living species, um, and then expanding that window once more uh, to consider the evolutionary history that connects us. And inside of this, you see, this is called a phylogeny. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and this is sort of tells the evolutionary story of how we're connected and different from other species. By expanding this window, we can not only um, better understand the cause of disease, we can do a better job innovating, coming up with you know, better approaches, um, more creative approaches, more effective approaches uh, to health. Um, and that is the root of sort of what I do. Um, but in the past couple of years, I've been thinking more and more about adding to that uh, an additional perspective, which is the fact that not only has human medicine been very much focused on our species, it's been pretty male-centered. Uh, many of you may know that until uh, 1993, women were pretty much excluded from clinical trials that were funded by the NIH. And until 2016, female laboratory animals were pretty much excluded from preclinical trials. So uh, that's not, not a good thing. Um, but that by, again, expanding that window and um, adopting a broader, more gender and species and sex spanning perspective, we can um, save more lives, pr promote equity, all kinds of things. And um, I do believe this is true. And so in, in a sense, female health across the tree of life um, has as its goals um, a number of things, which include uh, improving the health and potentially even saving the lives of, of vulnerable women and girls around the world but also to promote the health and potentially even save the lives of vulnerable female animals around the world. And um, while it may sound uh, like a big uh, bite here, uh, this kind of approach, which explicitly recognizes the deep, ancient, and inextricable connections across species and with the planet um, on which we all evolved, um, these approaches are necessary if we're going to actually uh, have the kind of future that we all want. Now, I think it's interesting as a physician that um, this is true. It's more than interesting. It's, it's, um, it should be pretty earth-shaking, I think, to any human health professional to read that the director of the World Health Organization this year um, is said that climate is the single greatest threat to human health in recorded history. And that is something that as a physician, I mean, I hear it as a citizen, I, I hear it as a parent, I, when I hear it as a as a clinician, as a physician, um, it should absolutely uh, shake me to my core because I've taken an oath to promote human health. And yet physicians and other human health professionals, you don't see them necessarily at the forefront of the climate movement and, and active in biodiversity um, campaigns. It's a, it's a broader story, but I think that um, there are some opportunities here to change that. So my own story, really quickly, uh, I'm a human cardiologist. I, I uh, did my training you know, back east. I, I came back, did a bunch of training residencies and uh, chief residencies and, and fellowships at UCLA, became a faculty member in the Division of Cardiology at UCLA, and then I uh, had the opportunity to uh, participate in some cardiovascular consultation um, at the Los Angeles Zoo. And uh, that was really in the mid 2000s. And it really opened my eyes up to all kinds of things, including um, many of the commonalities um, in vulnerability to pathology between human and non-human animals, something which my very fancy medical education seems to have uh, pretty much overlooked. In medical school, we learned about zoonoses, sort of the infectious connections across species, uh, but, but very little about um, 
animals other than that, animal health other than that. I went on to, um, along with Catherine Bowers, um, publish a couple of books. The first was Ubiquity. I founded conferences to bring together academic veterinary um, uh, experts and academic physicians. And, um, and, and that was you know, rolling along. But I want to focus today on female health and share a, 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 a story. And I don't remember the exact year that this happened. But um, sometime in the late 2000s, uh, I was, you know, I would occasionally get a call from one of the veterinarians at the LA Zoo asking if I could come and do some cardiac imaging. And one day they called um, about a lion and she had, it was, it, many of you probably know this, she was an elderly lioness who had a collection of fluid in her pericardial sac. And the reason that this is important was um, in terms of female health was when I asked why, um, why the doctor thought that there was this fluid, um, I was told that it could be metastatic breast cancer, which sometimes can cause uh, collections of fluid in the lungs and even in the, in the pericardial sac. But because big cats in captivity have higher than expected rates of breast cancer. Now, this was something that, you know, uh, at the time, even though I was having this experience at the zoo, I hadn't really connected female health, women's health issues to the animal patients that I was um, given the privilege to participate um, in the care of. But in fact, um, this breast cancer connection was what would become one of many, many, many um, connections that I learned uh, exist between females across the tree of life. And, you know, it's true that a similarly dense nexus of connections link the health of males across the tree of life. But um, for a number of reasons, um, I'm focusing on, on female health for now. Um, one of those reasons is that even though we know that uh, climate change and other accelerated anthropogenic environmental changes are adversely affecting the health of all humans and, and all life on earth, women and girls appear to be disproportionately impacted. And so for that reason, um, we are starting with female health. And so today, um, Dr. Keller and I are going to spend a few minutes just sharing um, some interesting examples of ways in which female animals, uh, female human animals and female non-human animals may share strengths and vulnerabilities. Uh, so this is a picture of an actual coal miner uh, holding a canary. Uh, this is from the early um, early 1900s in the UK. And as you guys know, uh, they these miners carried canaries to uh, detect small amounts of carbon monoxide, which would then alert them um, to, to human danger. And this concept of the canary in the coal mine exists uh, and has existed for a very long time. But as we you know, impact the planet um, in all kinds of negative ways and the boundaries that used to sort of separate human from animal environments, as that boundary gets blurred, increasingly the kinds of environmental exposures that are affecting us are also affecting other animals with whom we live. And when you have shared exposure and you have shared vulnerability, that is when you, you as a species are vulnerable to the same problems, then you have a situation where every female animal, including every woman and every girl, has become a, a canary, right? And, and the earth is our shared planetary coal mine. In other words, it's not just what non-human animals can help us um, know about dangers to our species, we, our health, can help inform potential dangers to females of other species. And so let me spend a, a, just a minute or two, maybe, maybe five or so, not much, um, talking a little bit about this idea of, of shared vulnerability. So do human and non-human female animals share health vulnerabilities? And the answer is, Absolutely, yes. Not all of them, right? There are some that are unique to us. There are some that are unique to other species, but we overlap a lot. Um, what you see here is a paper that is actually about to be published. Um, these are uh, phylogenies, and, and not to get too deeply into it, but phylogenies are, are models that evolutionary biologists build to show the relationship between species and their characteristics. And you can see um, uh, you see, this is one for breast cancer, and these are all mammals, of course, and I was able to find examples of breast cancer in nearly every one of the mammalian lineages, 
now, obviously, mo the vast majority of, of female mammals are not going to get breast cancer, but this vulnerability exists in this very wide, phylogenetically widespread way. Um, ovarian cancer, you can't really see, but there are cases of ovarian cancer, not only in other mammals, but in birds and in reptiles and amphibians and even in fish and, and so on and so forth. So, so yes, we do share vulnerability. And the reason we share vulnerability is, is common ancestry. So a whistle stop tour through evolution. And um, let's imagine that the entire history of the earth, remember the earth started about four and a half billion years ago. If the entire history of the earth was an airplane flight from LAX to JFK, okay? If that were the case, Life um, would start at about sort of between Nevada and New Mexico. We'd have photosynthesis over Colorado. And it wouldn't be until the western part of Pennsylvania that we would see multicellular animal life. And it, what I think is just um, amazing is that it would not be. So here's Pennsylvania, right? Um, it wouldn't be until about 570 feet before touchdown in New York that our species shows up. And if you take Pennsylvania like that, and here's 600 million years ago, and you draw this sort of, we call this an x-axis, right? This is 600 million years ago, and this is the present. All of animal evolution has happened during this period. And we humans emerged about here, which means the vast majority of our physiology is shared with the other animals with whom we share the earth. And this concept of common ancestry is important. This is a, a different kind of phylogeny. But if an animal is, you know, if, if our species is vulnerable to ovarian cancer and birds are, are vulnerable to ovarian cancer and so are reptiles and amphibians and fish, it, one can um, conjecture that our common female ancestor also had this vulnerability. And therefore, the health of female fish and female birds and other female mammals with whom we share the earth today, that is highly relevant, highly salient for human health, for women's health. So why a group of beluga whales in the St. Lawrence estuary in Canada developed high rates of breast cancer and ovarian cancer uh, 20 years ago, why that happened, it turned out to be very relevant to um, the risk of breast and ovarian cancer to the women living there. Why some great apes are more and some great apes um, less vulnerable to endometriosis is significantly relevant to female reproductive, human female reproductive health. Even psychiatric issues, you know, postpartum depression um, is obviously a very significant issue. And um, postpartum depression is, we know that there are, there are a number of factors, biological factors, hormonal factors, psychosocial factors. Um, but it turns out we are not the only species where sometimes a new mother will um, have a behavioral disturbance and in some cases not nurse her young. Um, I'm actually writing a paper on this right now. Many of these animals respond to oxytocin, you know, the hormone, the bonding hormone. In any event, these are um, interesting, um, potentially overlapping, mechanistically related phenomena, vulnerabilities. Okay, so that's enough about vulnerabilities. Let's talk about strengths and resistances. And this is what I'm really interested in and what my research is, is almost all about now, which is beginning to look at how we're different from other animals and particularly how we females, how we may be different in our physiology and how some of the physiologies of other female animals may contain solutions to challenges which we have not figured out yet, challenges in women's health. So um, it's based on a field of called biomimicry. Now you've probably heard about biomimicry. It's this um, idea that you know evolutionary time, right? If we're talking about life starting 3.6 billion years ago, right? That's a long time for evolution to optimize and perfect um, and solve problems. Essentially, allowing animals to um, be optimally aligned with their environment to have maximal fitness. Well. 
we can, um, if we know that and we can think about it properly, we can turn to nature as a source of solution. So one example, not from medicine, um, comes from uh, the bullet train in, trains in Japan. So in 1964, uh, the Shinkansen trains were, you know, made their debut, was a very big deal. They were very successful, but they had, um, one of the problems that they had was that when they decelerated into the stations, they caused a lot of vibration and reverberation, and uh, they had to do something about that. Well, it turned out one of the engineers uh, who worked on the train, who had developed the train, was an amateur birder. He was a, a weekend ornitho ornithologist, and he knew that the kingfisher uh, is a species whose beak had evolved to um, be so sleek and contoured that it could pierce the water without creating any reverberation, no rippling, which of course would be a fitness advantage because if that, that bird would be less likely to chase away potential prey. And so um, they ended up redesigning right, the, the nose of the bullet train to uh, be based on the shape of the kingfisher beak. So this is the concept of biomimicry. I've been working for several years now with um, a group of physiologists in, in Denmark, with a number of veterinarians, with um, uh, colleagues both at Harvard Medical School at UCLA, um, with folks in San Diego, UC San Diego, and uh, most recently uh, some folks at San Diego Zoo, their pathology um, group, to understand um, giraffes as a species that may have solved what is the leading cause of heart failure in women. And as a cardiologist, this is something um, that I know I've dealt with quite a lot. And I don't want to get too much into it, but just the gist. Um, Giraffes, of course, have a brain that's about here and a heart that's here, right? So that's about two and a half meters above the heart. And that means that effectively the giraffe has a much, much, much higher blood pressure than any other similarly sized animal. Now, when we have high blood pressure, we develop all kinds of problems, right? We develop kidney failure. We develop heart failure, right? But um, the giraffe appears to have evaded that. And so in my studies, I look at the okapi, right? So the okapi uh, is the other surviving member of the giraffidae um, family. And the okapi, unlike the giraffe, the okapis um, sort of migrated into rainforests in the Congo, but giraffe, of course, were out in the savanna and developed this long neck, the okapi didn't. So okapi don't have a high blood pressure relative to other, other um, uh, mammals. But of course, the giraffe does. These are ancestral species. And so what we see is in giraffe hearts, um, by the way, the, the reason that the that are typically given for the long neck um, are the advantages of access to foliage. Um, there may be some issues with sexual selection, and even the ability to scan the horizon for predators. All of those would be um, fitness advantages, right? They would be selected for because they would be enhanced survival. But none of them would make any difference if the giraffe's heart thickened in response to that higher blood pressure and caused that giraffe to have the kinds of symptoms that my patients who have high blood pressure and a thickened ventricle experience, which is breathlessness and exercise intolerance. These are a couple of examples. There may be some physicians on um, uh, today. And if you want to talk about left ventricular hypertrophy, how about that? So that's LV, that's left ventricle, and that is the cavity size, right? So these are really very thick ventricles, and yet they can run 40 kilometers an hour. Um, so clearly, there are some adaptations uh, that allow them to tolerate this thick ventricle without a compromised uh, exercise. Um, the other project that's really gaining steam now is um, thinking about pregnant giraffes um, as a natural animal model for high blood pressure during pregnancy. So the pregnant giraffe has a very high blood pressure relative to other mammals, and uh, as many of you know, uh, high blood pressure during pregnancy, um, including something called preeclampsia, is one of the leading causes of both fetal and maternal mortality in our species. And so how does the giraffe um, avoid these complications? Um, we, I have a, a wonderful team of mostly women. We have a few um, men participating in this project, but all over the world. Um, and we are um, slowly um, developing hypotheses and um, doing some investigation to understand how 
um, how that happened. And, and maybe one day we will be able to derive inspiration from the um, amazing resilience of the uh, pregnant giraffe um, and, and help uh, women who are struggling with this issue. I'm going to um, stop talking and uh, turn it over to Dominique. Yep. Hey, hey Dominique. I'll see you there. <laughs> We're tag teaming tonight. So Barb, um, I'll just go through this and then if you want to click to the next slide. So if you aren't already wowed by female animals, uh, then well, you will be now because we're going to talk about a few things that just to me still make me think animals and humans are amazing. So for example, here are two species, two different species that don't actually experience menopause. So we'll talk about menopause in a few slides from now, but let's talk about these two animals. These are two groups of animals, very diverse, that are able to reproduce well into advanced age. And that's important because that's something that perhaps we can learn from to enhance human and animal medicine. The Greenland shark, for example, is one of the animals that I'm continuously fascinated by. They're one of the largest sharks out there. They're extremely slow. They live a really long time, but because they live so deep in the water, it's very difficult to study them. The estimates right now are that these animals can live to be anywhere from 250 to 500 years and may not even reach reproductive um, adulthood basically until they're about 130 to 150 years old. It's incredible. And because of that longevity, um, they, they produce probably anywhere from 200 to 700 baby sharks in their lifespan, but you know, not many of them survive. So they may have maybe 10 per litter. It's still a little unclear, but what's amazing is it's thought that they can reproduce way into their old age. So, you know, a shark that might be 500 years old could still be reproducing. Elephants are very similar. They can reproduce, we think, up until their 60s, if you're an Asian elephant, and maybe a little bit, a little bit less than that, if you're an African elephant, uh, reproductive fertility does decrease as you get older, but there's no evidence that these animals actually cease being able to reproduce it's what we call menopause. So I think there's a lot to be learned there. Um, and so this is just you know, fascinating how these animals can do all these things. But we'll skip on to the next one, which is Barb. So okay, I turn it back to Barb. Okay. Um, oh, here's a, a great one. So osteoporosis, uh, which, you know, is a osteopenia is bone loss and then osteoporosis is a softening of the bones. And um, for women, you know, once we have reached post reproductive age, and even even when we are still cycling, um, if there are periods where we, we don't ovulate, then our bones are deprived of that monthly estrogen that really helps strengthen bones. Well, it turns out, um, this was a product of a, uh, one of my Harvard classes. Um, one of um, our student groups came up with this great um, hypothesis. Um, we, th they challenged themselves to identify female who uh, in who ovulated infrequently and um, Dr. Keller correct me if I'm wrong but as I understand it female uh, giant pandas ovulate maybe once a year a kind of like a a, a, a 72 hour window of yes, tiny window incredible but but and yet they have very good um, very strong bone density we actually have a paper about um, about their bone density so how does that happen and um, not going to get into um, my students wonderful hypothesis uh, but you can imagine that it's if we ovulated only once a year, right, during our reproductive life, uh, we would be faced with some significant um, osteopenia and osteoporosis. Okay, um, Dr. Keller. All right. So we're going to change topics yet again, but it's still about reproduction. So my background is actually in reproduction and kangaroos happen to be animals that are probably some of my, my favorites in the whole world. I could probably talk about kangaroos all night, but I won't. So just for the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about a concept called super fecundity. And, and in terms of kangaroos, what it probably means more accurately is the ability to produce more offspring than they're going to survive. And why is that important if you're a female kangaroo? Well, if you've been to Australia or you read the news, you know that Australia is a continent that is very, very challenging to live in. Most of the, the, the center part, for example, is very dry. So red kangaroos tend to live in desert areas. Other kangaroos, like the greys, like the ones we have here at the zoo, tend to live in more forested areas. But the one thing the kangaroos have involved together to be able to sort of face well is this trial by environment. So fire, drought, extremes of temperature are things that kangaroos have adapted to, to live with. And what, one of the ways they do that is by being able to maximize the reproduction. They actually reproduce very slowly, but they have several strategies that are fairly unique in combination. One of them is that they can actually, while pregnant, um, because the gestational period of a red kangaroo is about 33 days, you know, they're born about this big, um, so as soon as she delivers that baby, which has to find its way to the pouch, she becomes fertile again and is usually mated and will then start 
having another baby, but the baby is like a little hundred cell embryo that then arrests. That's called embryonic diapause. And as long as she's nursing that baby in the pouch, that little tiny embryo is going to be in stasis in the uterus until it's potentially needed or mom's finished nursing the other baby that's in the pouch. She can also, while she's nursing one baby in the pouch, have another one that's called the young at foot, which is where the baby's out of the pouch but still nursing. She makes two different kinds of milks to support those babies. And where does this come into in terms of things like climate change and environmental pressures? If, for example, things get tough and mom can't nurse anymore, she's going to probably have to sacrifice the baby in the pouch to survive herself, which will then activate that little embryo that's in a reserve so that she can start the next generation, hopefully with better resources when the drought ends or the fire season is over. Incredible, incredible resilience in these animals. I hope you see them in a different light the next time you see them here at the zoo. So our next slide is something different. I keep changing topics because there's just so much to cover. We mentioned menopause and how you know the sharks that I talked about, those Greenland sharks and the elephants don't seem to go into menopause. Well, here's a species that does, and this will surprise you. We think there's maybe five different species of animals, including humans, that actually go into menopause where you stop ovulating and you continue your life. So, uh, and not only that, but usually a productive life. And recent studies have shown that um, female orcas actually do this, and it's to a huge benefit to their offspring and their offspring's offspring. It's something called the grandmother effect. If you're uh, a grandmother orca and you stopped reproducing, but you're the pod leader and you've got your daughter and she's got her kids, those grandchildren of yours have a higher survival rate if you're still alive, productive, and helping them around. That grandmother effect is seen in humans, but it seems to be a thing for orcas. And the key is that that, that grandmother orca is She's best serving her population, her pod, if she's no longer reproducing because she doesn't have to worry about the pressures of reproducing, which are huge. She's not competing with her daughters or other females in the pod. She can focus on leading them to where food is, is you know, available, which is really important as resources are diminishing in the ocean. So super interesting. And we all can relate to grandmothers, right? So I can go orcas. And then the last thing is to kind of tie it back to what we started off with with Dr. Um, Tedder was talking about the climate and health and you know how that affects us. So I'm going to finish off my little like tour through the animal kingdom and the amazing things that these animals can do. We're talking about female pupfish. These are tiny little fish that are native to the southwest here. In fact, there are a population in the Salton Sea. These guys um, are able to reproduce, and you can see in the picture that follows, they're just tiny. They're about this big. They live about a year. Um, and they have about three reproductive seasons in that year. And these females and the males and all the babies are able to live in extremes of temperatures up to 100, 114 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a population that lives in um, a Mexican hot spring. They don't have a choice. It's always about 114 degrees in there for them. Um, but they're able to, to live and reproduce at those temperatures. And that's something that we can potentially live for because, or learn from. Because if you think about it, climate change is going to affect them severely. They're already living at the thermal extreme. They don't have a lot of leeway. It's important for us to know how to help them survive. And perhaps they can teach us how to survive as the environment changes. All right, Barb, back to you. Thanks, guys. Oh, that is amazing. I mean, God, I, I, I could listen to you. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's so interesting. Um, I'm going to wrap things up and just, um, I, I have this term, I, I'm actually using this for a project, a sisterhood of species. And, and I really do think that there is, um, there is a sisterhood of species. There's also a brotherhood of species. There's lots of ways in which uh, we're connected to other animals that we might not have thought about before. Um, but there is this sisterhood of species that, that connects us through both our vulnerabilities and our strengths. And um, it's uh, something which I think should be a source of awe and, and responsibility. Um, so who better to end the talk with than um, a, with a quote from Rachel Carson. And of course, Rachel Carson, Carson launched the modern environmental movement uh, with the publication of Silent Spring in 1962. Um, what, what you may not know is that, um, is that Rachel Carson died two years later uh, af after the publication. She died in 1964 of breast cancer, a disease which has now been linked directly to DDT, the same chemical that she identified as compromising the reproductive health of the female raptors um, that she described in Silent Spring. So in nature, nothing exists alone um, is what she said. And um, that I, I don't think there's any other a better way of, of expressing it. Um, so I want to, again, just really thank the Los Angeles Zoo um, and Dr. Keller for giving me this incredible privilege uh, to um, collaborate and learn, and um, would love to take questions if there are any. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Nadison Horowitz and Dr. Keller. That was an incredible amount of information and just so stunningly interesting. I, my mind is like, um, so thank you both very much. Um, we have a comment. Thank you so much. It was an incredible talk. I see some friends on this. I people that I, I'd like to ask some questions who know who know a lot about things I don't know much, as much about. Uh, so we have a question on any thoughts on cross species pediatrics. Uh, Dominique, you want to? Oh, I think it's the same, right? We we tend to talk about well, right now we're talking a lot about reproduction because one, it's my area of interest. But I mean, of course, yes. There's so much we can talk about in terms of you know as simple as c-sections that, that's the beginning of pediatrics i kind of see it that way but yeah absolutely we we call on people all the time to advise on things we call in lactation specialists we call in people in during the pregnancy period postpartum things as simple as you know what to do with animals that just don't feel like they know how to deal with their animals with that full rejection syndrome that arb was mentioning is really interesting there's there's the potential as i would say unlimited as you can see by the brief glimpse we kind of gave you um from this whirlwind tour uh, just to add on to that, there, there are a couple of er a few areas that are really interesting to me about uh, kind of species spanning pediatrics. Um, the first is, is this, there's this concept um, in the last decade that's really gained steam of the relationship between adverse childhood experiences, we call them ACEs, um, and the risk of, of both physical illness and mental illness later in life, right? We know that there's the ACE score is very important in pediatrics. Well, it, it, it turns out there's a literature, an emerging literature from veterinary medicine that um, it, it's particularly coming from uh, the dog uh, in the dog literature that um, that some dogs that come from, um, you know, commercial breeding facilities where there may be abuse and where care is very poor and maybe nutrition is poor, that their outcomes in terms of biobehavioral, so, um, you know, um, behavioral issues later in life and health issues, there's a parallel. Um, you could call it adverse puppyhood events, I don't know. But um, I think the idea that there is this species spanning vulnerability that connects early life with um, vulnerability in later life is 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 fascinating. Um, and the other thing, of course, you know, I, I, Catherine and I published a book about comparative adolescence and uh, that there, there was so much research, so many years of research. And it was, one of the most stunning things to me was how similar puberty is for uh, not just mammals, but um, even going back to reptiles, just the the sequence of um, you know, I don't know if how, how much of a, of a PG crowd it is, but um, all the all the exciting things that happen during puberty are remarkably overlapping with other species. Again, yeah, uh, speaking of um, pediatrics, the next um, LA Zoom to you will be babies and SFPs, and I believe Dr. Keller will be speaking more about pediatrics, so everybody should tune into that. Uh, so another question we have is how did giant pandas quote solve osteoporosis? Let's see who asked that question. I, I see some, I see some friends, but okay, doesn't matter. Well, it's um right now we don't we don't know for sure, right? So in a way, it's it's a very um, you know, in all of my classes, I start every one of my classes by telling people to check their human exceptionalism at the door. And here I'm sort of saying, you know, how do they solve osteoporosis, right? Like, it's not a problem for them, but it is a problem for us. But one of the hypotheses has to do with bamboo consumption and the phytoestrogen that um, is, in, is in bamboo, and it particularly some of the microbiome that's associated with uh, native bamboo species that are eaten by, by pandas. So um, they have a different, uh, they basically have a different metabolic pathway that um, this hypothesis um, uh, invokes this different metabolic pathway so that ultimately they end up with uh, downstream exposure to the component of estrogen that's important for laying down bone. So that's it's a hypothesis, though. We that's not a that's not a published paper. And sort of on the same lines of that, how close are we to seeing some of these issues that have been quote solved in animals, solved in humans using what we've learned from those animals? Um, I love that question. It, this is in its infancy. I uh, I feel like this is my life's work, and I'm really um, it's wonderful uh, to be kind of out there doing some of this work as a. Um, "Quote unquote pioneer," but the challenge is it it it's not it's not been done much at all, and so a, there's a lot of um, education 
that's required of my colleagues, of, of my colleagues who I admire so much, because our, our education, our medical education is so uh, traditionally devoid of, of, of knowledge about the physiology of other species. And so, and I understand why there hasn't, you know, the case at that point in the past wasn't made for these connections, but the course that um, Dominique and I have been teaching, um, it, uh, it, our goal is really to change that, um, to make, you know, because the more that human health professionals know about animal health and not just the diseases that they get, but the incredible physiology, I mean, the stuff that you heard today, um, and the more you know, they're steeped in that, then they can be better at thinking about um, solutions. The, the giraffe, uh, the giraffe paper, that project is moving along. We, we, I don't anticipate having a solution to um, what's called HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in the next year. But um, we're hoping that this approach will produce um, approaches that will be effective someday. Uh, so the next question, what is your best working hypothesis regarding the mechanism of cardiac hypertension tolerance in pregnant giraffes? Okay, who's asking that question? That's Dr. another Dr. great Habib. question. <laughs> oh, um, hello, Dr. Habib. Um, yeah, so, well, here's what's really so much fun about this. So as, as you know, there, the, um, fa this fantastic giraffe genome, there was a giraffe genome that was published in 2016. And then it's about like within the last year, um, Chang Lui's group, they published this like beautiful new um, uh, genome. And what we basically see is that the groups of genes that are um, responsible for um, that are involved with ACE2, so angiotensin 2, are specifically different in giraffes versus okapis. And so there are a couple of the, the hypotheses that we have, and I can tell you more about it, are derived from that genomic observation and also um, what my group of summer undergraduates, right? These are undergraduates um, identified. We were reviewing okapi and giraffe placentas. We were looking at the villi and we noticed different patterns um, in the binucleate cells. So I can share more with you later, but um, come, you should join our group and you'll help us. You'll help us crack this this case because it's so it's so much fun it's so interesting and collaborating across disciplines with colleagues around the world it's just um, it's it's wonderful um, and this is a off topic question for Dr Keller but um, has the LA Zoo started vaccinating any animals for COVID nineteen oh we sure have yeah actually we finished the first round uh, for the first group we were able to get a a set amount of vaccine. We actually finished that in October. Um, so we're expecting to get more from the group. Uh, the, the company's called Zoetis. They make animal vaccines. So to be clear, we're vaccinating with an animal vaccine, not the human vaccine. There's, there's some talk about whether it would be, you know, useful to use human vaccine in animals. And I think we've all decided that's not ethical at the moment. There's just still too many people who need the vaccine themselves that are it's the human vaccine. So yes, we actually have started the vaccination process. And as soon as we can get more, because the company is donating the vaccine to the zoos in the U.S., uh, we will complete the vaccination process for the animals that haven't gotten the vaccine yet. So we're very excited for that. It uh, was a huge, huge thing for us to get that process done. Thanks for asking, actually. <laughs> uh, well, thank you both Dr. Madison Horowitz and Dr. Keller. That was a really great presentation, and we're going to close with that. Um, so I will now turn it back over to Tom Jacobson. Thank you so much, Beth, and thank you, Dr. Nadison Horowitz and Dr. Keller. That was an amazing talk, and I learned so much, and I want to follow up on so many of the topics that were broached today. It's work like this that is at the core of what we do at the LA Zoo. Another important aspect of our work at the zoo is conservation. Recognizing the rise of two urgent threats to our communities, rampant biodiversity loss and social inequity, this summer, the zoo launched its first ever conservation strategic plan that brings the zoo's unique strengths and expertise to bear on these challenges. At its core, the CSP is a pledge to protect plants, animals, and the habitats we share through actions that also advance social and environmental justice. Its ultimate goal is to create a just and sustainable world where people and wildlife thrive together. Very similar to what Dr. Nadison Horowitz was speaking about just now. 
The Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association led the effort to provide the seed funds to make the conservation strategic plan a reality. This is what we do to provide our partner, the Los Angeles Zoo, with the resources to make their dreams a reality. This past year, your generosity made a huge difference in our effort to bring back the zoo experience you know and love. Your gift is an investment in the future of Glaza, the LA Zoo, and a healthier world for us all. Moving the conservation strategic plan forward will take a collective effort from all of us, working together to drive change. There's a link in the chat to donate to Glaza's annual fund, and I hope you'll make a gift today. I'd also like you to save the date for some upcoming events. On Saturday, January 22nd is our Searching Safari, and this is an event that is returning um, after the pandemic has eased a bit and uh, it now returns with an emphasis on animal nutrition. Safari Society and corporate leaders are invited to find out cool facts about the zoo's on-site commissary and to learn how animal nutritionists provide the zoo's residents with healthy and balanced diets 365 days a year during this exclusive zoo scavenger hunt. There will be special animal feedings and keeper talks and that will happen throughout the morning and there will be a light breakfast provided for the human attendees. The next LA Zoom to You is Thursday, February 3rd, 2022 at 4 p.m. And the topic will be drills and mandrills. And the speakers will be our curator of mammals, Candace Clementi, and director of conservation, Dr. Jake Owens. For more information about upcoming events or for assistance, please contact Robin Savoyan, Associate Director of our annual fund. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's LA Zoom to You web chat presented by City National Bank. I learned so much, I'm just uh, knocked sideways by everything that uh, was presented today. Come see it all in action at the zoo. We hope to see you here soon. Have a wonderful evening.